This is our planet radio. This is our planet radio on the modern and uh, this is a special edition. We are going to talk about some interesting subjects today. Continuing with the track that we've been on for some time, presenting modalities and tools for healing. And uh, I have with me today a roundtable group of people, and we'll start first with our guest who is from Australia. His name is Steve Richards, and he has a website called holographickinetics.net. We're going to be talking about dream time healing, holographic kinetics, an advanced Aboriginal healing modality. Steve, welcome to Rock Planet Radio. Thank you. And with us also from uh, California is Annalie Cummings, and she is responsible for pretty much introducing us to to uh, Steve's work. Annalie, welcome. Thank you. And uh, to my right, rotating clockwise, Miranda Kelly is here. Hello. And Duncan O'Finian. Hey, guys. So, um, Annalie has been in contact with me for, I guess, a couple of months now, talking about the work that Steve Richards has been doing and helping her with healing from her own traumatic background. Um, Duncan and Miranda no, need no introduction. Their background has been well documented in the interviews that we've done together. What we all share together on this call today is an interest in bringing out ways for people to heal specifically from tra trauma-based um, backgrounds, um, PSTD or DID, however you want to you want to term that, and the kind of traumas that come from deep emotional wounding. And so, Steve, maybe what we where we start first is. Give us some background on who you are, where you come from, and how you came to be doing the work that you're doing today. Yeah, thank you. Look, it really started as a four-year-old, and my, my mother sat me down and wanted to know how I knew certain things. And I just remember today looking at her and thinking, well, doesn't everybody remember everything? Because I remember the past, and as an Aboriginal descendant, I had full memory of the ancient past. Now, as I grew up, when I was eight years old, I could make water go around my finger without touching it. By the time I was a teenager, I was doing mind magic. I used to do hilarious things at parties, but the question was, I wanted to know, what am I doing, how do I do it? So we go, that's the spirit coming in. Now we go to the genetic line. My great grandmother was taken away at the age of eight by what was known as the Aboriginal Protection Agency. She was found in horse shackles at the age of 14, sold to a drover, and died at 15 giving birth to my grandmother. My grandmother was brought up on a cattle station, as she used to say to me, after being educated. I was different to the rest because she was taken under the wing by the church and they educated her good and proper. But the Aboriginal maids, servants, butlers and the gardeners took her under the wing and they taught her the old ways. As I grow up, she talked talk about the old ways and that would trigger off more memories in me. Uh -huh. And that led, I believe, to where I am today. You see, I come from a culture that's 60,000 years old. It didn't take shopping trolleys with it when we went shopping. It used to go out into nature and communicate to the trees, to the animals. Everything's alive in nature, and they were aware of this. Now, what they'd do at night, they'd sit around what's known as the dream time. And they'd communicate to the spirit of the kangaroo, spirit of the guana. What they wanted to, they communicate that spirit. That spirit would donate its vehicle, the body. The vehicle is in fight or flight, but the spirit, when it donates the vehicle, moves to a higher octave. It moves up the scale. So it evolves in another dimension of reality. That's how they get their food. 
So you basically were born knowing not only your own spiritual background, but you had what I guess we would call ancestral memory as well. We all have genetic memories in us. Right. The only th right. Is most of us have suppressed those memories or allowed the memories to come down the genetic line to affect us without knowing why they're affecting us. Okay. Um, Anna Lee, do you want to kind of uh, give us some background here on how you came to access Steve's work and what it means to you? Yeah, um, I have been really actively searching for healing, you know, really all my life. What, what Steve just said, memories come down genetically and, and we know they're affecting us, but we don't know why. I mean, that's a perfect segue. In 2009, I had a spontaneous Kundalini experience, psychic surging, um, full-on 3D present entities visiting me. I had possession issues, and it all ended up in um, kind of a flaming inferno by August. Um, so then I began the long trek out of that dark night of the soul, which was a year or more. Um, and finally found Miranda's work uh, and Duncan's work in November when I had my personality completely split again and was like, oh, I really do have this problem. I need to start working on it. So, um, you know, since 2009, I was just filling myself in with all that I could with, you know, David Icke's work and understanding the socio-political global scene. Um, trying to understand the alien phenomena, what that was all about, and, you know, on sort of the fast-forward course that many of us who are awakening have had to do via the Internet and books and that. So in January, I um, happened to be listening to a radio show, much like this, um, with the folks down at East City, um, which is a place that has a lot of UFO activity out by Mount Adams. And they were interviewing a fellow named George Kavasilis, who's also Australian and has had a lot of alien issues in his life. And he just offhand in the radio show, they were talking about clearing and what you can do to clear. And he said, oh, yeah, and I use holographic kinetics to get rid of the winged serpents. And I was like, wait a minute, pause. I need to, so I just kept going back on the MP3 trying to hear, you know, what is this holographic kinetic? So I pretty quickly found Steve's website and um, read through his material. And, um, you know, Miranda had said this as well, that even just reading that material, something clicks um, that if you're dealing with these kind of issues, possessions, alien abduction, um, genetic memory, in my case, some stuff with black projects with my parents, all of a sudden you read his material and you go, okay, this is something that works. Because I'm one of those poster childs who, you've talked about this with White Wolf and a number of your guests, there's a million alternative modalities out there right now, and, you know, 99% of them are going to get you worse off than where you were at or only do a little bit that you then have to build upon. And so I found the holographic kinetics and sent to my story and within a few weeks had been set up to um, get some sessions done with one of his students who's a practitioner and from there my healing just really skyrocketed. I mean there was stuff that I absolutely don't know how I would have gone through because it was literally, I mean if I'm looking at my, my transcripts here, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years old which makes you realize how old our spirits really are and not long to really just the member. So that's how I found it, and that's kind of where I'm at with it right now. I think one of the things that each person on this call has in common is the sense that uh, our destinies have been played out in our past through the bloodlines and through the genetics of, uh, of our families. Gosh, what is that noise? Anyway. Um, so this is a key issue of being able to trace back ancestral memories. Um, can you explain for me, Steve, the holographic aspect of this? How does holographic and kinetics play into this? Let's maybe break that down a little bit. Uh, okay, we'll go back first 
have to steer that noise. That noise is uh, the stuff going next door. Okay, and, uh, okay. No problem. We'll live with it. The Dreamtime Healing Path, Aboriginal culture, which they were fully aware of. And our mainstream system is not ag acknowledging Aboriginal culture. What it's doing, and out of millions of dollars, I mean millions and millions, put into you know, Bring Them Home report, Deaths in Custody report, the rights of Indigenous in Australia, the rights to human rights in Australia. The, um, there's been royal commissions, and out of all of these, what's come out of every single commission is the elders have stated, we need to heal the spirit. So what takes place is the government looks and says, well, we're giving you spirituality in the form of religion. Well, that's got nothing to do with it. The spirit is traumatised through time. Now, the spirit is different to the soul. Most people have no, different, no idea of the difference between the spirit and the soul. Mm -hmm. Now, the soul is linked down the genetic line and the external experience is upon us. And there's a difference between the two. It's vitally important to understand because what we're dealing with is we're dealing with the spirit, which is totally different to the soul. Now, in the research that went along, we realised that every cell in you is a hologram. And every cell in you is a hologram that tells the next cell which is a hologram. So the whole being is actually a hologram itself. And when you change one part of the hologram, it goes through what I call the defragging process, where that hologram, the next hologram, tells the next hologram, and it changes the whole being. When you take out something physically that's coming with the spirit, so you've got the spirit in there, something else has come in, and this is where it's, it's linked to a lot of the ritual stuff, because the whole, like, whole idea of the ritual stuff is to traumatise the spirit. That lets something else in when the spirit's traumatised, to then try and take over the soul of the being. So what takes place then, in the, once the spirit gets taken over, in other words, the spirit gets suppressed, the other being takes over, then the soul now is programmed from the moment you're born. Everything external to internal, everything projected upon you becomes programmed into your cell. Now to understand that, the old culture says the father is the sun and the mother is the earth. Well, the sun have electrons. And it's electrons we actually capture by the act of a thought. Even by our intent, it's electrons we capture. Now, once they're captured, they become inverted electromagnetic flux. Once captured, they become a thought. They then become a thought form. They then evolve into a life form. As a life form, like a blade of grass, like a tree, like a dog. It has the right to survive. The tree knows it's a tree, the grass knows it's the grass, the dog knows it's a dog. But that thought form only knows the thought that created it. Just say it's anger. It will rearrange the universe, us electrons in the universe, to conform to its reality using you as a host. It's evolving, it's learning. It's learning about your reactors. As you react to it, it learns, it evolves. It's learning what makes you tick. And eventually it tries to take over the physical being by moving to the next level where it becomes an entity. So holographic kinetics is the fact that kinetics is the movement of energy in this universe and how to harness it. We are a hologram of time, so therefore we are harnessing energy in the universe which is a hologram of time. Now in the hologram of time, let's take your genetics. I can access the great 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 grandmother through a hologram of time, come forward, come forward now. Next minute, she's talking out of your body because through you is a hologram of all the ancestors through time. Now I go to the spirit, and I can access the hologram of the past, no matter how far back in time the spirit needs to go. So there's how holographic kinetic comes on. He comes to the point that you read about spirit being in all cells, and um, when you take out something physical, and particularly if you do ritual or traumatize it, then you leave this pathway open for the soul to be programmed and things projected on it. I mean, I think that was where my process with HK really started. My um, my mother's a, a human geneticist who's been in the forefront of the human genetics program, and I actually have a blood genetic blood disorder which she shares and my grandmother shares. And so from a very early time, they were taking my blood. And now this is like, you know, the science. So there's, it's untouchable. It's not like we're doing some satanic ritual and people are drinking it and calling out beings. But right. they were still taking the blood. And that's the first thing that I knew 
where I have to figure out who were these people, what were they working with, because that taking of blood, I mean, sometimes it was I was asleep as a child. My mother would come in, draw blood for me, um, and do these experiments with it. She'd say, oh, I need it for a control sample for one of my experiments, which she was running on other disorders. But there was something in that that I knew. I was like, these people are taking part of me without my consent, and that's where the whole, you know, am I being abducted? Are the, are the graves doing experiments on me? Why do I remember my mother involved? And that was the hinge that really, um, you know, made me realize holographic kinetics is going to help me because he, he delineated that, um, you know, that even if the trauma is just some cell, um, it counts, right? And then, of course, you know, it was more than the whole cells. It was my whole being. But, um, but that was the first thing that really made me say, okay, there's something to this and we can go forward here. Okay, so basically you think that your blood itself um, was being taken and this was a fractal of your entire being. Is that what, you, what you're saying? Yeah, it was, part, it was the part of the story that I absolutely knew I could confirm, get to and remember, but then it was holographic to the whole. I mean, and it went through, you know, initiations and rituals and knowing to people who were doing incantations and being and so all that happened some of it in this line lifetime some of it in other lifetimes but it was that one piece was holographic to the whole and it was the piece I I had no um, you know sort of opportunity for self-doubt there because with so much of this stuff as you know there's this moment of well is this real am I crazy but that I could could realize and then everything else was holographic to that so then we go back through and clear it and it made sense to me you know why that would would be the, the starting place okay because a lot of and Duncan and Miranda can confer, can confirm this that um, bloodlines play a key role in people who are pulled into projects um, bloodline and genetics are a key issue and family connections as Duncan and Miranda can also attest are key elements of who is selected to go into different programs and what they are selected for so we're, we're dealing again with this whole idea that you know we're, our, our entire com component being is somehow encapsulated in that that genetic material the, the DNA the genetics the blood Right, and I mean, part of the story I had been told about my blood, my mother was actually the person who cloned the disorder, so uh, little red flag there. She went to the Galton Laboratory in London, England, which is right down the street from Tavistock Institute, <laughs> and was the first place where they were doing the genetic program after World War II. They basically took the Nazi program, transferred it to London, Thank you. and it was out of the Galton lab. Thank you. So, I've wanted somebody to say that for a long time about Tavistock's connection to the Nazi experiments. Yeah, well, I mean, it wasn't specifically Tavistock. This is through University College London, but I mean, come on, they're down the street from each other. There's a reason for that. And this was in Darwin's old house, you know, that they turned into a research laboratory. and. So, you know, the story, again, holographic to the whole, moving out through the layers. And so what they told me about my blood disorder was that one base pair of the amino acid had changed. And as a result, under certain conditions, so if you read that as conditioning or control, um, it would shape shift, it would change its 3D tertiary structure and cause a small crystalline precipitate in the blood. So that was, once I started to read sort of, I went through the whole new age nightmare, but you know, there was some stuff there that was useful, but oh, crystal blood, oh, I have crystal blood. In fact, it's genetically diagnosed crystal blood. Oh, it shapeshifts. Oh, what about those reptilians? So again, figuring this stuff out um, step by step, but it went back, you know, and Steve can talk about this, how you, you set up these cycles hundreds of thousands of years ago, and then they just play out. And what I would ask Steve is how does, how, when your spirit chooses the form to come into in this lifetime, the genetic line, how does that relate to these old chords and patterns that and set time loops that you set up way back? Like, how does the spirit know that, oh, this genetic line is really going to um, make me remember that problem I had? 
That's actually a good question. Steve, you want to take that? Sure, sure. One of the things about the spirit, what does remember, you've got to understand the moment of we, the spark of life connected to us, that spark, the moment the spark connects to the heart, it's the spirit. The spirit's connected to your heart. You know, we deal with people who go back to the moment of conception where the trauma's locked in, and the, the spirit's activating that moment of conception of what was locked in, which is affected being right through time. So, when the spirit comes in that moment of conception within the heart itself, it brings with it all the memories of the past, but for it to come into the vehicle, what takes place is, we, we, again, you've got to understand two facets. There's one facet, what our governments are doing today out there, and what they're playing with, they're playing with occultism, and occultism is limitation. They're not understanding L-O-R-E, which is universal knowledge. The universe itself is more powerful than any occultism whatsoever. Now, to understand what they do with your blood, the Aborigines used to go out and be able to say, well, they could nowadays, they still do it nowadays, you know, and they have what's known as mussing. And mussing, all they need is a little bit of your hair. That's all. Like a bit of your hair, it's got the whole genetics in you. This is why some cultures around the world won't have a photo taken of themselves, because that photo is a hologram of you. And they can do things with that hologram once they've got that photo of you. So your blood, all it needs is one cell of blood, and that is you. A hologram of you through time. So, but under law, under law, Man is responsible for his thought, his word, his deed, and his actions. And no man can escape the cycles of time. Now, what's that mean is whatever we've put out in the past that we chose for our experiences to experience in this dimension, in this physical vehicle, we must be responsible for. Example, if we chose to go to war and want to mutilate and kill, the universe says, well, that's fine, that's your reality, but you must experience what's like to be mutilated and killed. So what happens is, you will come back to parents that are going to assist in what you need to learn by the lessons. If thousands of years ago, you three of free will and choice made an agreement with these beings, the first law in this universe is the law of intent and the second law is the law of agreement. And the law of agreement is valid through time and space for eternity until we unfold space time on that dimension. So thousands of years ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, you made an agreement and you part of rituals then that agreement is still valid today. So you'll be born under parents that are continually going to set up these scenarios of rituals. And through the rituals, what takes place is when your spirit enters the vehicle, the body, through rituals, the firstborn child, firstborn child usually is allocated to them. What's that mean? Mm -hmm. When the spirit enters, a draconian enters. Once that draconian enters, it will try and set up trauma for the spirit once the spirit becomes traumatized, it takes over the vehicle, thus takes over the soul. Now it uses that vehicle and it will keep the vehicle traumatized through time. As it grows, it has taken over the vehicle and eventually is put into positions of power within this physical world of ours, where they are running human bodies. Okay, so now given that we have those two primary laws, I'm assuming there's a third way here, and that would have to do with the choice we make, otherwise we wouldn't be having this conversation in terms of healing. In other words, we have the ability to interrupt the cycles and the patterns and void the rituals. Is that correct? That's correct. You see, any time at all, you can look at something in your life and say, I've had it, I've had enough, that's it, no more. I don't want this anymore, thank you. Your spirit's there for you. It's there to give you what you want. All it's been doing is, it's been setting up the future for you because you never told it otherwise. You made the agreement, so it says, well, all right, I can't make changes, they're your agreements, so it allowed us to continue. Once we make that change, we want to make a change, then we have to unfold space time. We have to go back into the past, so in the present we go back to the past, we look at what took place in the past, we then change the past by externalising the past and replacing it back in time. The moment we place the past back in time, so in the present we change the past, the past and the present sets up the future, and we change the future cycles of time from this moment on. Time will loop itself, put you outside time. To give you an example of that for a moment, I've got a lady who's driving home at night. She pulls up a set of lights, looks up to the right hand side, there's a big semi bearing down on her. She freaks out, it's all she remembers. She gets home at quarter to three in the morning. 
Husband's pacing back and forth, he's ropeable. She was due home at nine o'clock, four hours of missing time. She came to see me because she assumed that she'd been abducted. From the moment I started working with her, her spirit took her straight back into deja vu, past parallel, where all this has happened before. She got the set of lights, looked up, meh, big semi bearing down, bang, it hits her. It took four hours for her to die. This time, as the past reproduces itself, deja vu, sets itself up again in the now with a few variables, gets a set of lights, looks up, semi bearing down on her, she lets go instantly. The moment she let go, time instantly looped itself and put her outside four hours. Now I looked at that and said, well that's interesting because I've had some very weird experience happen in my life where I should be dead at least four times. Right, right, right. Yeah, I do too. And, <laughs> and what takes place is the moment one's accepted that, time loops itself, puts you outside time and changes the time track. <laughs> uh, you just put some pieces on the table for me. Wow, that was, that was pretty powerful actually. Uh, can I jump in for one second? Sure, please. Go ahead, Duncan. I just Duncan. have a, uh, a question. Um, with the, the, the time uh, thing, um, you just made me, Richard, made me recall oh, something that happened um, over 30 years ago now. I was in a very sound sleep when I suddenly woke up and I'm sitting up in bed and <clears throat> I'm... Um, repeating the words, time is a loop, time is a loop, time is a loop. That's right. Do you think that has any bearing to the conversation at hand, or was that just something in uh, Miranda and I's off-the-wall off the wall world? <laughs> oh, um... Steve, do you want to field that question? Your spirit is fully aware of everything that's ever happened to you in your past. And what can take place is, in the sleeping state, and this is really interesting, this one here, because, you know, let's go into your sleeping state. Let's go into your dream state. <coughs> some, sometimes in the dream state, you have a dream in the dream. And what happens is you wake up from the dream and you realize that that dream was only a dream. But you're continuing with a dream, aware that you're a dream of a dream. And in that dream you can manifest realities. In that dream you can change and you can produce people. You can do all these things. And you wake up next morning and you realize, is it just a dream? Now, the reality here is, when we die, we're going to look back and this is only a dream. If in our dream we can manifest realities, then why can't we manifest realities in this dream? We can, but we've forgotten. So sometimes your spirit is trying to make you aware of these cycles of time because we become stuck in cycles. I look at the prison system and I see the poor guys in the prison system. I don't know your honour, why well, I keep doing the same thing over and over. Stuck in time. I don't know your honour, I have a few beers, it's like something takes over. It does. <laughs> no one's listening to these people. You can turn the prison system around easy by applying this approach. Okay, Steve, you want to mute your mic when you're not speaking, so that because Annalie's a little hard to hear. Sorry. Um, Randy, you had kind of started this particular strain of the the interview with with talking about where does the healing hinge, and what Steve was saying was, well, you have to get to that point in time where you made this agreement, and you know, I had gotten to this point where I was like, well, obviously this is happening because I understand I'm drawing it to myself. I understand at some point where this agreement happened, but the question is, is where's the hinge? Like, you're just looking through your life and you're struggling to find where's that hinge because if I could find it, then we could move forward. And what really helped with the holographic kinetics was sometimes, at least in my, my session, where the agreement hinged was really an incorrect or a damaging assumption about what was going on. And this is where the whole mind control thing that you work through with a lot of folks on your shows really comes in. And we can be talking about whether it's very specific mind control in black projects down that route, or we can talk about the more subtle mind control that goes on at places like Disneyland and those kind of programming centers, or we can talk about what goes on in families like mine who 
you know, a committee of 300 related families, stuff with genetic bloodlines, people working in, you know, scientific stuff. And the kind of mind control that goes on there is, you know, something bad happens or they treat you badly or, you know, you're neglected or, you know, they take your blood or whatever happens. And then you, you start to say, no, this isn't right. This isn't it. And then they immediately flip it over and say, oh, but this is for the good of humanity. And, you know, and so where those assumptions are was what I have to get at to understand where that loop in time was. And if I can give a short example from my transcript, because Steve gave some great examples, but I, the incorrect assumption um, that I had to get to was that, oh, these people are important. They matter more than me then I should allow this. And from there, that's where all this stuff happened. And when these things came through, once I got to that, then these winged serpents came up, the aliens with runners came up. And as soon as my spirit said, oh, that was an incorrect assumption to think that these people were more important, then all of that could be blown off and the timelines recreated. But until I, my spirit recognized that, that's where it goes. So that's where the holographic kinetic technique has been really helpful because if you want to change it but you don't know where the hinge is, you can really get to that. And then after these sessions happen, there's this period of integration where you slowly feel yourself shifting and you you feel everything repatterning because you know, oh, every time you hit that, oh, well, they're more important and really I should give this up or blah, 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 whatever your incorrect assumption was, then you shift that and so things disappear. I'm sitting here I'm, si I'm sitting here wondering as I'm listening to your story, Emily, and having done extensive interviews with Duncan and Miranda and other people, if internally there's not a decision point. You talked about the hinge and I think in just thinking back on Duncan's story and the car accident and the MRI, thinking about Miranda as things began to unravel for her it seems like internally it was like there was a clock ticking where it was time to deal with this before that for whatever reason the soul wasn't able to deal with it the body the mind the consciousness doesn't seem to be able to deal with it um, is there a timing aspect to this within the soul itself that determines when we make the decision that we're going to finally deal with this and stop I guess the pattern that had been programmed in, the programming, the screen memories, the cover-up stories, the uh, the wiped memories, is that part of the soul pattern itself? And that, that question's for anyone that wants to answer it. Well, can I have an answer there? Absolutely, please. Okay. For one, I, th I think we've got to get away from what everybody keeps on referring to and that is the soul. You see, your spirit came here and chose a vehicle, but didn't choose to come here and get imprisoned in this vehicle that's been genetically engineered to amnesia. Now it wants out. Thank We're you. at the end of the big cycle right now. And as we come into the end of the conjunction of this cycle, all the experiences you've had are in the end cycle now. This is about the time where you've got to deal with your stuff now. If you haven't dealt with it now, then Groundhog Day. When the conjunction takes place, then we back here again. So what takes place is your spirit is leading you into where you need to go. It's leading you and saying, hey, I want to get out of this game. Wake up yourself, fella. <laughs> and it's making you virtually become a little bit more aware about the scenarios that you've got within your, your programming. You see, remember, the spirit is the internal being that can manifest this universe and rearrange this universe, it can manifest realities. The external to the internal is your soul. So the spirit's internal to external, the soul is the external to the internal. From the moment you go to school, you're getting programmed. People are programming religion, the pe people are programming external realities upon you. Your radio, your TV, the media, the government, you're getting programmed constantly to the soul. Everything you take on as in your cells is alive and you're allowing all those life forms to run you. Every day, you get up and those life forms are running you. You get in your car and you go down the road, fill your car with petrol, before you know it, in the coffee queue. Did you go for a cup of coffee? No, you didn't. But the life form says, I need my fix. So you're giving it its fix. All these life forms in your cells, you're letting it run you until you become aware. 
hey, this is about taking back control of me. And listen to your spirit and then start to communicate the spirit again. Because the spirit is the most important part. We have forgotten. My culture has been saying, you know, every single time we need to keep the spirit healed. We need to heal the spirit. We need to heal the land. You go into areas where they, they totally clear the rainforest. You've got trees that are traumatised. You've got the land that's traumatised. You bring the spirit of the tree through and it'll talk to you out of the body on the table. It'll tell you what's taking place. It's traumatised. We need to heal the spirit of the people and the spirit of the land. That's the most important part. That is so amazing and profound. I'm just sitting here drinking all of this stuff in. It, I really want people to understand how important this is right now and how it's helping us get a much deeper understanding of programming, how we're controlled, and to finally have the tools to break this cycle. This is magnificent knowledge and, you know, from the Aboriginal culture, 60,000 years old, you said, Steve. We are so lucky that this knowledge didn't disappear. We're so lucky that we have this lifeline and we need to hold on to this knowledge and get it out so that people can start to heal. You know, the programmers, they, they know this already. They've been using it for a really long time and they've been trying to keep it secret. And, you know, meanwhile, we have people coming into lifetimes already burdened with all this stuff and this yeah. programming and dealing with it. And this, to me, is such a valuable tool. We have help now. We have a way of understanding what's going on and a way to shatter the cycle of trauma that goes beyond black projects. It covers every kind of trauma possible. Thank you. Um, because what I was sitting here thinking as Steve was talking is this. Um, people listen to this show. They listen to shows like it. They've heard the stories. And there's an entertainment value in this, I guess, for some people. But they listen to the shows and they go, boy, that's, that's really horrible. I'm glad that's not me. The fact of the matter is what Steve pointed out is that everybody has been, and, and remember we did that interview, that first interview with you, Miranda, and we just like spontaneously went, everybody's been mind controlled. Yep. That reality mm -hmm. is the reality that the listeners need to get, because some people will be drawn to this because they really need the help, they really want it, they're really damaged. Other people are dealing with lower level traumas that are just as significant, especially right. when you factor in what he's talking about, the ancestral aspects, the spirit aspect, is huge. So, in effect, it gives you an idea of how big the, our work really is because we're talking now about healing an entire planet because the planet is sick, the planet has been infected, it has been uh, completely raped and pillaged and had great violence done on it, and because we're all connected, we have this this entire malignancy that's that's now encircled this planet. So I want the listener to understand that you're not outside this group, you're part of it. The other thing is when you were talking about the, uh, the woman with the tractor trailer accident, I'll just say this. When I was 17 years old, I was in an accident. I was in a head-on collision with a tractor trailer in a very tiny foreign car. I believed for a long time that I did not survive that accident, and yet I have no reason for, under, for why I, I believe that. Um, but that age, that particular period of my life was a turnaround, and I'm just threading through this right now, and this is, I guess, my therapy. Um, things began to come back to me, and I began to deal with other things, but the accident itself was a catalyst for waking up and going, wow. I need to deal with some things in my life and I need to find out what's going on inside me and I need to figure out why I have this feeling right now that I died in that accident which nobody believed I should have survived. The car was literally shoveled onto a flatbed truck and it's one of the things that over the years my parents before they passed away said, we have no idea how you survived that accident. So I don't know what that means. I'm still fretting through it, but I think it was a linchpin. Uh, what Annalie called, great term, 
kind of a hinge period for me in beginning to unravel some of my own stuff. Do you have any insights into that, Steve? Why do I think that? Sure. sure. Uh, I mean, um, look, can I just, can I just, remember we thought I should be dead four times. Well, one of those was 18 and a typical, typical teenager. Trump was a scum and I went surfing at 9 o'clock at night. Well, I caught in a rip and going down for the third time, I let go. And I remember my arms floating, I remember just about to pass out and all of a sudden a hand reached into the water, 9 o'clock at night, a guy on a surfboard reached in, grabbed me by the hair and pulled me out of the drink. That was the first time. Second time, I was in FJ Holden, little windows, squashing into a telegraph pole. I'm 100 feet down the road walking back to the car. The third time, I'm on a motorcycle, I'm broadsiding down the road on my side, about to go onto a Volkswagen. And I remember saying, oh, well, here come a couple of broken legs. I accepted it. The moment I said that, instantly there was a zap, and I was put in front of the car. Time loops. Time loops. Time can loop itself, and I believe that something within our spirit says, okay, you don't need that dimension, let's change the reality instantly. So we can better, at each time we change that time loop, we have a choice of a new time track to better for the future. Let me just explain a little bit more about the spirit and the soul example here. Okay. Uh, and there's two examples. One I want to explain, and that's about the programming of the soul, but we'll get the spirit and the soul. I've got a model in Europe, she comes out to see me. She gets up on the catwalk in front of thousands of people, no problems. But every morning she wakes up with anxiety and doesn't know why. We get on the table, her spirit indicates 16. Thank you, go there now. I remember a friend come and stayed and slept on the lounge room floor and I felt something happened. Thank you. I remember is the soul. There are four parts of a person on the table talking to me. There's the ego, there's the soul, there's the spirit, and there's life forms trying to justify the existence out of a person. This is the soul. I act, thank you, I acknowledge that. Step aside. Spirit, come forward, come forward now. Spirit, what's your place? He drugged the body and he raped me. He drugged the body and raped me. I couldn't wake the body. The spirit had that trauma. Now, the other one I want to go in and just explain how powerful programs are. A lot of women out there feeling not good enough. So I've got a woman there, not good enough. I'm dealing with her. I go back thousands of years ago. She's a virgin, lined up with all the rest of virgins. And the high priest is coming along, picking out the virgins to be sacrificed. Thank you. Continue what's happened. I wasn't chosen, I'm not good enough. That's where it locked in thousands of years ago. Today, that program is still running, I'm not good enough. Till we clear that dimension. Wow. Wow, that is amazing. <laughs> Actually, I was just gonna ask Steve if you wouldn't mind kind of walking us through what a session with the person entails. I know you can do it remotely as well, but just sort of from start to finish, how how it happens. Sure. Well, the first thing I do is, is to understand, holographic kinetics understands the mass and the geometry of our universe. And it is. Our, our universe is based on mass and geometry. To understand that is you're a singular and your spirits are singular. When any two singulars come together, they create a third. Just say, just say your spirit was blue and your ego is yellow. At the apex of the triangle is going to be green, neither blue nor yellow, but the integration of the two. So before you even come, you and your spirit have to make an agreement that you want the session. If you're coming because your mother wants you to come or your father wants you to come, you're wasting my time. It's vitally important that this person makes an agreement with their spirit. The moment that intent, if they, they're sick of this, I want to get rid of it, there's your agreement. Now, I lock on to the, again, look straight in my eyes. I lock onto their spirit themselves and I get an agreement from them. Once I get that agreement, I now control the game. Now, if anything's attached to them, it's a co-creator of their reality. Now it comes become co-co-creator of my reality. And now it's stuck in my reality and I know how to deal with anything that comes into my reality. So what we do now is I ask the spirit, what is the issue on this person first off and their spirit, the issue you want to look at? When you tell me what it is you want to look at, I then ask their spirit, what's your emotion behind it? What age do I need to go to? It might say three months during conception. Thank you. I go around the top of the head and I hold on two little points at the back of the neck. Spirit, go there, go there now. Thank you, what's happening? Mum and Dad are talking about having me aborted. Thank you. Oh, actually, here, here's a case. I'll give you a case. This this one here was recently at the 10 Embassy and a young Aboriginal girl came up to me, she's been on drugs. Can you help me? Can you help me? I said, look into my eyes. 
As I locked on to, I hit her on the shoulder. I said, Spirit, send her to the cause and effect of why she is the way she is. Next minute, she's curled up on the ground in a little fetal position. I said, little spirit, how old are you? I'm two months inside my mummy's tummy. Thank you, little spirit. And what's happening? Daddy punched mummy in the tummy. Daddy punched mummy in the tummy. And how to make you feel, little spirit? They don't want me. And that's why she's on drugs. I looked, time changed, time changed the dimension. Went in after frequency drugs, blew me out of the system. She'll be right from now on. Wow. So how do these, uh, well, how does the soul and the spirit and the various co-creating entities communicate with you? Do they communicate verbally through the person or do you hear them in... No. Verbally through the person. They'll be speaking out of you. I mean, I have things sometimes sitting up on the table, hissing and spitting at me. I've had blue eyes, turn orange, yellow slits in them and... <laughs> but nothing's a I had a woman from France. This is one of the best ones. A woman in from France. Next minute, she physically metamorphed on my table. Here's a 22-year-old woman, one moment. Next minute, an 87-year-old Chinese grandmother curled up on the table speaking to me in Chinese. I said, Spirit, send her back to the cause effect invasion this force. Next minute, bang, she's sitting up. I'm a Roman Catholic. Reincarnation doesn't exist. The <laughs> system instantly overrode her spirit. Because remember, this is a molecular mortal world. Your assumptions and beliefs have the right of this physical molecular being to override your spirit. And it cannot make changes while you choose to run the show. Do you understand? Very important, that. Yeah. Well, a lot of this is based on agreements that people made, either knowingly or unknowingly. And I imagine a lot of the programmers try to get the spirit to make these agreements without the person really knowing about it. Is that how it works? Yes, but if you start to have a look, look at, look at religion. Religion has been a program for thousands of years. Program from your mother to your mother to your mother, all the way down the line. And it's a programming to you, and the belief system of that program is that reincarnation doesn't exist. Now, we live in a culture that's all waiting for Jesus to reincarnate back again, but reincarnation doesn't exist. <laughs> we can see society I look at. That was a gem right there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I have um, one instance. I know you both have these matching scars on the back of your spine. And right. I heard your story about that a while ago, and then went through my process with HK and I was amazed because there was, um, I think in my second session, this thing came up about my spontaneous Kundalini experience. And so we were doing this session and if I can just read a snippet from what came up so listeners can see what that kind of process is like because when you're doing it as a surrogate, as Steve and I spoke the other day, it's not the same. You get these transcripts later, but they're like, oh, bingo, that's exactly it. I remember almost being there in the session, practically, if I can, can get there. So the emotion that came up was that I was wicked, and it was first activated in this lifetime at age seven. Traveling. I'm not at home. I'm traveling with mother to mom's work. She's taking me to see a man. I don't know why. I don't like it. I have seen him before. I don't like his eyes. They regard me strangely. They regard me like I'm an object. I'm scared of him. I don't trust him. He does strange things to me. He is tapping me, tapping my body, all over sometimes, my spine. He pulls on my legs, pushes on my body. He's manipulating my body. He's straightening my spine. My spine didn't need straightening. Why did mother take me if I, this was not necessary? I don't know why my mom took me. The man is casting a spell, chanting. I'm dizzy, I feel funny in my body, my body feels strange. He knows what he's doing. He made me feel funny. My body feels light and disconnected. I feel disconnected. My mother is pleased. This man is her master. She goes there regularly. She does everything this man says. It's not father. I've got pain. In their eyes, it's going well. They have plans for me. I don't know what they are. They are happy about it, but I am disconnected and scared. They say I am growing up. I want to grow up. I want to please mom. And that's the hinge, Randy, that we were talking about. He put a gap in my spine low down, instruct spirit to, and then this is the practitioner, it instruct spirit to go back to when you want to please mom. And this is why you are doing all this. You want spirit to take all illusion aside and see why my mother is doing this. It is the first step in initiation. Do you still want to please her spirit? Yes. Why? I love mom, but I am frightened of her. Is that any reason to please her? I have no choice. So again, hinge number two, I have no choice. Mm -hmm. And then the practitioner says, but everyone has free choice. Mother said do it for her. 
You see, Mother was using her for her own purposes without your welfare in mind. Spirit then sees that. It is all right to love Mom, but it is not all right to do things that are detrimental to your own being. Spirit understands and blows out the connection to needing to please Mother and everything related it to it locks it out, and then gathering up all dimensions with the first stage of initiation, where that happens through all dimensions, and hooking onto any other stages of initiation in this lifetime that are active, anything that has been affecting this lifetime that had to do with the initiation on all emotions involved, and then blown out, sever the timeline, sever all connections, and lock it out. And so I just wanted to share that because it totally linked to what Duncan Miranda had said. It relinks to the the hinge idea, and then it also is, uh, you know, what what Steve was saying with you have to get spirit to acknowledge us and, like, stop letting soul drive the bus, you know, and that's the hardest thing to do, <laughs> and I'm still working on it every day. But that's really such a profound part of it is that hinge concept of finding that area where you can change things and solve it, fix it, and heal. It's incredible. You know, so many people have tried, you know, myself included, all different kinds of modalities only to run into a brick wall, knowing there's something there, feeling around for it in the dark, and not being able to grasp on something that will actually affect the change that you're looking for. So I think that's incredibly helpful and profound. And Steve, I had a question for you. This is something I had discussed with Miranda about the problems with having been a programmed person and and trying to do hypnosis to get to the, these memories. And my question is, is about how entities get involved. Because with hypnosis, I felt like, okay, I got to the trauma memory. I got in the trauma memory. I'm being traumatized again by the memory. <laughs> and I am also happen to be out of my body because as soon as I get hypnotized, I'm one of those people who just goes out of my body like at the drop of a hat. And then I felt like I came out of hypnosis with, like, whoever astral hitchhiker happened to be on the block. So my question for Steve was to talk about why the holographic kinetics modality can be helpful um, as opposed to some of these other things like hypnosis or that um, and really get at the core of it without coming in with more stuff to clear on top of what you've already got going. I hope that noise isn't, I'll have it finished in a second or two. The hypnosis accesses the soul. It's, it's hypnotizing the same as you take NLP, you take kinesiology, you take a whole range of other modalities, and they're all accessing the soul. Thus, the vehicles externally in the cellular memory of the being. The spirit is a nucleus. It accesses... The spirit is totally different to the soul. I look at the spirit and say, the spirit is like the nucleus of the atom, and the soul is the electron around the atom. Now, when they come together, create the molecules of the physical being in the reality we've got today. When you go to the nucleus, thus the spirit, then you get into the cause of the effect, and it can change the soul. The soul can't change the spirit. So when you go in after the soul, and you're changing the soul through hypnosis, you're deprogramming, you're reprogramming. You're still doing a program, but not changing the soul. Not changing because the spirit can change the soul, but all you do is you're changing the program in the soul, the hypnosis. Great, thank you. Yeah, and so many of the hypnotherapists these days want you to do NLP with it as well. And it was like, oh, I just got over the programming. Like, please don't install, you know, quit smoking and lose 20 pounds by next week. You know, I just don't <laughs> need that. You know? <laughs> so thank you, Steve. That makes a lot of sense. Um, um, a lot of what I hear from people who have undergone hypnotherapy, and I'll, I'll talk here a little bit about both trauma-based uh, people and people who have gone through perceived um, alien abduction is there is a movement out there that is taking people and putting them under hypnotherapy recovering so-called memories but I'm finding that the hypnotherapists themselves are predisposed to a certain outcome and I'll give you an example I've read several books by a woman named um, Dolores Cannon and Dolores Cannon has worked extensively with uh, ET abductees for over 20 years. 
Dolores Cannon is predisposed to the idea that everybody is basically under an illusion that they've been abducted, that they consented to this, that what has been done to them was part of their soul contract, and that really what they perceived as being wicked and evil and nasty to them was not really any of that. It was simply their perception of it, and she uses um, different hypnotic suggestions throughout the course to keep people calmed down. Reading her process and reading the literature that she's put out on her methodology, it sounds like exactly what you just said. She's reprogramming on the fly as she's doing this. Yeah, can I just jump in here really fast sure. about the hypnosis issue? For those people who've been part of Black Projects and that kind of specific mind control programming, hypnosis is incredibly dangerous because they install um, suicide programs where the person will be programmed to kill the hip hypnotist or therapist or anybody who attempts doing it or kill themselves, harm themselves, have their heart stop beating. So specifically for people who have been in, in black projects, I just, Duncan and I feel very strongly that hypnosis is not the way to go. And we're only speaking on our behalf in our experience. Duncan has direct experience with that. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. The abduction question, um, you know, we might turn it over to Steve because when he and I were talking, he said, he said something, he said abductions were more of a problem several years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I think he said, but not so much now because aliens have their clones and hybrids. I mean, maybe we can segue into asking Steve about um, this abduction phenomena and how it's playing out and what his information um, is about that. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to hear that as well. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I go back when I first started putting this together and, you know, five years prior to putting this course together, I've been 12 years teaching, that goes back really, you know, about 15 years now. And back in those days, you know, I was one of the only people in the world that could deal with abductions. And there was quite a lot of abductions taking place. And what I would do it in false space time, back to the cause effect of the original agreement in time, no matter how far back in time I was. You see, one thing I realise is there's law, L-O-R-E, and for a planet to be suspended in space, there has to be laws of law. And one of the laws I've found covers all dimensions. They're all governed by these laws. And one of those laws is nothing can invade the space of another without permission. So they had to get permission way back in time. Once they got permission from you, that was an agreement. That agreement's valid through time and space for eternity. The same people have been abducted today are the people that made the agreements thousands of years ago. So by unfolding space time of the dimension and going back to the cause effect of the agreement and breaking the agreement way back in time, we'd actually stop those abductions from taking place into the future. It ceased to be. Now, it does 10 to 15 years ago. And in that period of time, they were taking a lot of eggs from women and they were taking sperm from the men. But today, in a lot of the underground bases, they have their own hybrid species, they have their own cloning sections, and they have their own thousands of human bodies that they are actually reproducing. Now, I don't want to go too much into this area because we're getting some pretty touchy ground here, but I've sent people out of body into areas that you know, we shouldn't be in as observers. Now, one of the bad things about the universe is that anybody can go and observe any game without interfering in the game. And the next morning we had visitors, big fellas coming in through the walls and uh, interfering, but because they came into my game and I controlled the game at the time, I then went in after them and dealt with them as well. Um, I won't go in too much into it, but there is, and they don't need to do abductions nowadays because virtually they have their own clones, they have their own hybrids. Agree with that. I would agree with that. I don't know. I know. I don't know what to extent they have the clones and the hybrids. I do know the hybrids are out there. I've seen them, and um, there have been others who have stated what you said as well that the abductions basically had ended ten years ago. So uh, there. Let me ask you this, and this is a little off the rim, but because I have people that come to me with a lot of different things. What about um, what we would call interdimensional or extra-dimensional entity abduction? 
Okay, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole range of things out there today, you know, interfering with people today. You've got one, you've got thoughts, thought forms, become life forms that evolve into entity, internal. You've got external entities out there, you go to the local pub and you get the gobs and the alcohol, your defences are down, and they come and they take over. You've got genetic stuff that can have stuff attached to it down through the time, or you can have other beings attached. You can have animal spirits or human spirits in there. You know, animal spirits is an interesting one. I mean, I had a, I had a beauty one day, this guy, he's, he's been over 20 psychiatrists and psychologists and no one can help him. He comes to me, he holds his arms out and he says, look at this, and he's got stitches at both elbows. He said, I get thrown around the room by visible force. They broke both my arms, broke through my ribs. You know, another time jumped in my girlfriend, ripped half the hair out of my head, clawed me. He said, this thing's huge, I want to get rid of it. I said, okay, get on the table. I said, when did it start? He said, 10 years ago, I went to a party and I got drunk. I woke up the next morning, there's a guy in my chest got the living daylights out of me accusing me of stealing. Never been so petrified in my entire life. From that day on, this thing would surface. It was huge. He had picked me up, throw me across the room, threw me down flights of stairs, broke my arms, broke my ribs. I want to get rid of it. Back on the table. I access my call this thing up, and next minute I'm hanging to his head by these two points I'm holding, and he starts physically shape-shifting. His mouth extends out and he starts yawning long yawns and belching. And it's like something 20 times my size belching away on the table. I thought, what in the hell have I got here? So I said, spirit, how far back in time did this take place? And instantly speaking out of me, spirit said, 1,500 years ago. Thank you. Go there. What happened? I'm a hunter. Thank you. And what's happening? I hunted down a bear. Thank you. What happened? I was close to the bear. I thought it was dead. It was still alive. It turned on me. Bit of my right arm, bit of my left arm and clawed me to death. He and the bear have now both died in an integrated universe of fear which has been asleep for 1,500 years. 19 years ago, when he'd never been so petrified his entire life, it triggered off that dimension which now overlaid itself in present day. The spirit of the bear is there and he wants out. It's showing him around the room. I had to bring the spirit of the bear up in false space time, send him back 1,500 years, change the past and the present for the future, then send, put him aside, send the man back 1,500 years, change the past and present so it never occurs in the future cycle of time, Release the spirit of the bear. The guy gets up, my God, he said, it makes so much sense. I've had nightmares for years about being attacked by a bear. But that's not all. Look at this. He took his shirt off and turned around his back. His backside and his chest were covered in hairs two inches long. The thing was morphing through into him. Because, and this throws Darwin theory totally out the window. Because Darwin theory is based only on the physical structure down the genetic line. It does not take into consideration the other forces that enter with the spirit and they're in the vehicle. You get people sometimes barking like a dog and plucking like a chicken. Tourette syndrome. I go in and type up the animal spirits and take them out. No more Tourette's. Then you get people with, animal, with human spirits. Soldiers of war. Man, look how many soldiers you've got suffering over there. Well, I have extra vets on the table. Forty years after Vietnam War, I have spirits of Viet Cong talking out of the body. Speak to me in English, what took place? They tell me what took place. I'm in full space time. Change the past and present for the future cycle. Release the spirit and instantly the 40 years of mental trauma is no longer there. That's just some of what we're dealing with. And then there's the big boys through the rituals. So you've got a whole range of things. You've got, you know, you've got animal spirits, you've got human spirits, you've got entities, you've got draconians, you've got the big winged serpent fellas, the hierarchy, and a whole range of other beings out there who don't even know what they are. Apart from the alien stuff and, yeah. So there we're some of, some of what we're dealing with. And Randy, if I can just add in here, I mean, I've had three sessions, I've had two for my kids because stuff was coming out through them as I worked on my stuff. I had Syrians come up, I had Greys come up, I had a genetic cluster, I had an octopus thing that looked like a purple blob that was sucking energy off the top of my head, and I also had Pleiadians come up, and I wanted to point this out. Folks are so into their guides and listening to tuning into their interdimensional guides and stuff, I think that's great. That's a, a good first step on trying to expand your mind, but it's really important for people to understand that once you get in there with spirit and you find out where these hinge points are and you clear this stuff, almost every single thing that I was calling on as a guide, I had a lot of animal spirits um, as guides, you know, I'd see a hawk in the sky and I'd be like, oh, it's a message from spirit and stuff. Well, you know, they, birds were, um, dinosaurs were draconians and it was totally related to that. And so it's really important for people to just tune into their own spirit and be willing to lose 
all the stuff that doesn't matter. I mean, I lost the guys and I got myself. I stopped talking to my family and I got myself. And you have to be willing to punch through all the illusion to get to where you're free. And I mean, when I had my first session, I felt instantly, as soon as the session was over, a million times better than I had in literally hundreds of thousands of years. And I could remember that. And now, you know, weeks and weeks have gone by and I kind of am back to living the life in, you know, the 21st century. But it is incredible at what I was convinced was my friend when really that was the exact force that was causing my subjugation and my enslavement. And so I just wanted to throw that in there, that it's really important to look at this and the Pleiadians, the Syrians, not everyone out there is your friend. In fact, most of it isn't. One of the, uh, uh, sorry, Nate, I, I was just, just going to say, the point you point out there, I think is very important for people to understand because too many people out there Remember, these beings that have been manipulating our world have been around for thousands of years. They've been manipulating people at the very highest level, so our world has virtually been run for thousands of years. But the only way they can get in through law is by agreement. So all these people out there calling in the gods, the guides, and everything else outside of the reality are giving power outside of themselves to something outside of themselves. The key is inside yourself. It's with your spirit. It's not outside yourself. The positive beings out there in other dimensions, they know you cannot interfere with the involvement of the species. The moment you interfere with the involvement of the species, you enter the game. The moment you enter the game, you're subject to laws of the game, now you're trapped in the game. The moment you enter someone else's game, you're subject to laws of that game. Everything is about dimensions and what I call the Torres field of a dimension. While you're in your own field, you're in your own field. The moment you enter someone else's space and someone else's game, you become subject to the laws of that game. And this is how all these secret societies... You talk about the incident before with, with the mother and, and rituals. I guarantee she would have had something manipulated in her because when they get to that high level of manipulation, the human species believes that what they're doing is right because these beings are manipulating the brainwaves of the human to justify what they're doing is right. I've had people that have sacrificed their own children at rituals believing it was right. Who's putting the program in there to believe it's right? When your brain is being manipulated by other dimension, then you'll justify it in any form or any way because they're manipulating you into that justification that this is right. These beings are violating law and they can be dealt with. Anything that violates laws can be dealt with. I think a lot of people are waking up to that too and they're understanding that we've been manipulated on such a deep level and for so long and they're just at the point now where they're going, how do I fix it? So that's what I really like about this. This presents a solution for the, the problem. And I actually had a question for you, Steve, on that front. I remember reading your site and you were talking about um, if we're present when somebody dies or if we're responsible for the death of somebody, that can create an agreement situation where they enter our spirit. Is that right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll give you one very good case I had. I had. I had a woman came to me and she's had three spinal operations and she's riddled with pain. Eight years later, she's still riddled with pain. She's come to see me, and no, sorry, a lot longer than that, because she said eight years ago, friends of mine said it was an accident, car accident, and that was at 28. I got on the table because I'm not interested in what her friends talk about. I'm interested in what her spirit says. Her spirit said 18. Go there now. Next minute, she's screaming hysterically on the table. I forgot, I forgot, I totally forgot. What happened? I had a head-on collision in a car when I was 18. Thank you. What happened? The other woman died. Thank you. Well, straight away, the first thing comes to me is this reciprocal exchange of energy. So let's check. Sure enough, she's responsible for the death of this other woman. The spirit of the other woman has jumped into her. I brought the spirit of the other woman up. Boy, you should have heard. She was ropeable because this woman was careless and had killed her. She wanted to punish her good and proper. Uh. I said, listen, spirit. I said, everything's happening now has happened before. Everything's happening now will happen again. You don't want the same thing to happen the next cycle of time, do you? No, let's change it. We unfold the space time, change it for the future cycle of time, and I release the spirit. Instantly. All her spine issues she had disappeared. They weren't hers in the first place. 
If you feel sorry for somebody, yes, you can trap the spirit. I've had children, you know, I had a little girl, I mean, she's a woman nowadays, went back to four years old. She's on the grandfather's shoulders at the show and he had a heart attack and died. And the little girl's traumatised and she didn't want Grandpa to leave. Well, 40 years later, Grandpa's still in there. And he says, I want out. And he's going to be trapped. Okay, you've come into a, an interesting area here. We might as well go there. Um, is it our interaction with people at the time of their death that can create a situation where that spirit itself becomes trapped as a result of our energy inter interchanging with it? It's twofold. And the one way twofold is if we're responsible to the death of another, then that spirit has a right. And I say a right, in other words, What's this, under law? If I went downtown and I smashed your car to smithereens, well, under the universal laws, it'd say, well, hang on, you smashed his car to smithereens, he can have your car. Well, a body's a vehicle. When you destroy the vehicle of another, then the universe says, hang on, he can have your vehicle. So he has a right to jump into your vehicle now. Now, he's in there, and if you have a few beers, he can take over. That's on the physical side of the spirit having the rights to the vehicle. Then there's the cases where people, through their intent, I don't want Grandpa to leave, and they hang on to it. Now the other thing is, we go back, we go back in time, and quite often one year old thinking, what's happening? I shouldn't be here. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. The intent of not wanting to be here is an invitation for something that does. I wish I was dead. That's an invitation of something that wants to live. I wish I had a friend. That's an invitation for the little friend to appear. That's how powerful the universe. The first is the law of intent. The moment you put out, I don't want to be here, it's an invitation to other things that do. The moment you put out, I don't want to live, it's an invitation to things that do. The moment you put out for a little friend, it's an invitation for the little friend. First the invisible world, then the visible world. Okay, I have sort of a weird follow-up question to that. Um, Duncan's in my situation, we were heavily mind controlled our personalities were split into alternate personalities and we were sent out on jobs that resulted in the deaths of many people would we be considered responsible for those deaths or would the people who sent us out in these other personalities be responsible or both that's a good question <laughs> well uh, the, the one the judge say, when the court case comes and the judge is right before the judge, what's the first thing the judge says? You see, these fellas know law. The first thing the judge says is, what was the intent? Well, the other personality's intent was certainly for termination, but in our original main personalities, we were completely unaware of what was going on. Then if you're unaware of what's going on, then there's no intent. The intent is he who programmed you. And he who programmed you is now subject to law. In other words, he must come back in the future cycles to be programmed to understand his own programming. Okay. How can you escape? You know, this law, this universe has to have balance. How can a planet be suspended in space without balance? If the universe says, okay, you want to go and do this, then you must experience what you have done to another to understand that experience. For only then can you have balance. And only then can the universe be in balance. So you're, aware though, of what you did, you're aware of what you did, and by being aware of what you did, and having remorse for what you did, not being in control of the program, that doesn't make your intent as part of the program. Okay, even though it was technically another aspect of ourselves, this, these other personalities? Well, I've got news for you. A lot of the time, these other personalities are not personalities. There are other life forms that are being programmed into you, Yes. Thank you. Yes. I was, Thank you. That, that actually, <laughs> because I was going to make the distinction of what a personality is relative to soul and spirit, because in effect, an altered personality uh, created under trauma-based mind control is effectively an artificially created entity or even an entity that belongs to the person that was doing the trauma in the first place. Yes, yes sort of. Okay. Uh, okay. What I mean by the yes and no there was that it's actually an entity. You've got to get the difference between all of these. And I can guarantee what they're doing here is virtually a form of ritual. And in that form of ritual, you're going to have a draconian attached to you. 
it is going to be programmed, and that will be its program to carry out in you. Got it. Got it? Yes. And you can have many of them in there, separate programs. Can you have... Uh, so I guess, yeah, one of the questions I had uh, a while ago was, can an entity such as, uh, I guess, a disembodied person, so a ghost, let's say, who's trapped here, can that become a, quote, alternate personality? Can people or beings in the astral world actually be programmed as alternate personalities? And it sounds like the answer is yes to that. Again, again, I'm listening to your words. This is so important, these words. We talk about entities, we talk about spirits. Different, totally different. An entity is created by a thought. An entity evolves from a thought form to a life form, from a life form into an entity. An entity can evolve into a spirit eventually, take its own body down the track. Okay. Now, you've got, that's the, that's the entity. The spirit, the moment it comes into a spirit, it now chooses to come into a vehicular, into a molecular vehicle. It may be the spirit of a tree, it may be the spirit of a dog, it may be the spirit of a human. It comes into that vehicle, it now has the physical vehicle in this molecular structural world. And that is its vehicle. It can evolve from that. The spirit can move into the thermometer, then the gases, then the liquid, then the rocks, then the plankton, then the plant life, the insect life, the animal life, and the human life. And eventually evolve into another form again. Now, when the spirit comes in the vehicle, this vehicle is allocated to it, its vehicle. But through ritual stuff, what takes place is a draconian is also activated and he's now got the born rights. He enters the vehicle with the spirit and he'll traumatise the spirit. Now with that, each one of those can be programmed with a program to be taken over. So it's a draconian in there with a program. You can have many draconians, many different programs, and when they take over your vehicle, because you've been programmed to a switch and he takes over, he will carry out his program. These beans can be bought up on the table, and they can be taken out. They're violating law. Please go to part two for more of this broadcast. This is our planet radio.